For a century after the Civil War, black people were subjected to a relentless campaign of terror, a campaign that extended well into the lifetime of Majority Leader McConnell. Hi, this is Jacqueline Lugman, and this is The Real News Network. This week, the first congressional hearing on reparations was held on Capitol Hill in nearly 12 years. The obvious and typical conservative rebukes of reparations have come from the obvious and typical players like Laura Ingram and Mitch McConnell, to which ta Coates responded in the opening clip we just heard, as well as the interesting testimony from conservative columnists like Coleman Hughes and a conservative former NFL player and author Burgess Owens, who also testified at the hearing. As the discussion on reparations continues, we want to examine what needs to happen politically for the effort to move forward. To talk about that with me today are Anoa Changa. Anoa is an attorney and a director of political advocacy for Progressive Army. She is also the host of the podcast, The Way with Anoa. Hello, Anoa. Hey. Mark is a correspondent for The Real News and is with the Center for Emerging Media. Welcome, Mark and Anoa. Thanks for joining me again. Always. Thanks for having us. All right, so. At the end of the hearing, uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee announced that uh, several of her colleagues have already committed to pushing the bill that the hearing was about, H.R. 40, to a floor vote, which has never happened before, uh, as far as I can recall in the history of this legislative fight for reparations. Now, there are a couple of questions that I think we have to ask in this discussion that I'm not sure are being answered very well. And that's what I want to talk about. First of all, though, in regard to H.R. 40 passing, if H.R. 40 is pushed to a floor vote, how likely do you think it is that it will actually pass the House, Mark? I think it could pass the House. I mean, I think that there are enough people on the Democratic side that see its, if they don't see its importance to do, they may see its importance politically in this coming election. So I think that, I think it has a good chance of passing the House. I mean, remember, for all its detractors, this is not a bill that says uh, we demand reparations now. This is a bill calling for a commission to study and come up with proposals and wrestle with the notion of what reparations means. So um, I, I, mean, I just think that, I think it has a possibility of passing the House, yes. Anoa, what are your thoughts? Um, I agree with Mark. I mean, I think considering the like who we have in the House right now, the conversation to be had, I mean, I'm sure there are going to be some people who claim they come from regions and blah, blah, blah. But I do think when you talk about in the proper framing that's happening, I mean, think about it. This has been a 30-year fight to get it to this point. John Conyers, former representative John Conyers, first introduced this bill, I believe it was in 1989. Yeah. Um, and he had worked with Cobra and others going back to 1987 to actually even, you know, uh, uh, get get to the point where he was introducing a bill into Congress. So this has been, like, you know, most of my lifetime that this has been, you know, meandering its way forward. So, I mean, even the conversation that it, it would be brought up for a floor vote and getting that commitment is, you know, a win. It may not be the win, but it is a win on a smaller scale. And I, so I do think that there is an effort, an organizing effort. I think when we have the strength of, like, many of the different, different organizations and different to organizers and people really getting out there and educating and, and, and letting people know what this is really about, I do think I agree with Mark. There is the possibility and potential that exists in terms of the House. So obviously the next question is, if by some miracle, which both of you agree that maybe it's not a miracle at all that it could pass the House, mm-hmm. it's very, very possible. If it passes the House, does it die in the Senate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think it goes very far in the Senate at all. Maybe to the men's washroom. <laughs> uh, Noah, what do you think? I mean, we can't even get the, the we can't even get Mitch McConnell to bring up a bill about election integrity and security right. and ensuring our voting rights, right? And those that's something that affects everyone across the board. So, um, you know, we would have co- the House 
being able to to move the needle and, and just making the case, I believe, for why it is important to have uh, at least a few more senators in some of those seats that are up for grabs to, to flip the balance a little bit more. Um, but, but definitely, if someone could shift the balance away from Mitch McConnell, I mean, that's really where we're looking at. This, this notion that somehow uh, the Republicans are suddenly going to cooperate if a Joe Biden becomes president, it's, it's, we've seen time and again that they're just real basic procedures with their majority, that we need things passed and addressed. Like, won't even call things up for a floor vote. There was a bipartisan effort in the House on, you know, since they love bipartisanship so much, there's a bipartisan effort in the House where uh, Lucy McBath and others had got some gun control uh, regulations pulled together, and he won't bring it up for a floor vote in, in the Senate. He won't even let it be heard in the Senate. So, I mean, yeah, I got to get rid of Mitch. <laughs> so, Mark, you brought up the great point of what this bill really is, what H.R. 40 really is. It is not a bill to uh, implement reparations. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Representative Jackson Lee noted at the end of uh, testimony yesterday in her remarks that she would simply ask her colleagues who are opposed to reparations why they are opposed not nece necessarily to reparations, but why they are opposed to a bill that is designed to study reparations. Mark, is that the better question that we should ask? Are, are, let, me, let me backtrack. Are we framing this discussion about reparations in the most effective way politically right now? Probably, well, probably it's, per it's, it's perception reality here. Mm -hmm. I mean... The perception in a large part of the population in America is reparations means giving black folks for sitting around doing nothing. And it wasn't my fault because my grand I didn't own slaves, and I wasn't around when my great-grandfather was around. What do I have to do with the Civil War before that? I wasn't here. So, I mean, the, uh, but I think that the, the real opportunity here, if the House and Pelosi, they could do something different. They could, they could say, okay, the Senate didn't pass this, but what we're going to do is we're going to set up a commission out of the House to study this. And we're going to have people talk about this in our congressional districts. And we're going to set up conversations to kind of figure out what this means and why people talk about reparations. What do they mean? What's the history? I mean, this is, because this is, this is a golden opportunity to wrestle with who we are as Americans through a conversation about reparations. That's how I see it. I don't know how it, I mean, when people say, do you believe in reparations, I go, Yes, but what we, I think, we don't even understand, even those who say yes to that question don't know what it means. I mean, how does, how does that present itself? What does that policy mean? Right. right. And so, um, but it's an incredibly important discussion to have. If, they, if, they, if, they're, if they're worth their salt, they will have a group, a commission, we're going to study this and try to get as many con congressional representatives to say, we're going to take this back to our districts, in our schools, uh, in our churches, in our synagogues, in our mosques, in our places, to talk about what this means, to have a guided discussion about what this means. That's what we need to have. And that, that still could happen out of this if, if they have the wherewithal to do it, if. Anoa, you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's, that's the approach the Democrats should take, if, even I if it dies in the Senate? I mean, definitely, even if it dies, it's definitely a conversation that needs to continue, and it doesn't need to be led by hashtag activists on social media who have misguided understandings of, you know, greater context of foreign policy, domestic policy, white supremacy, you know, et cetera. It needs to actually have real clear organizing education, real strong policy conversations. I think Mark touches on something really important there where he talks about, you know, people going back to districts and educating people. You know, some people don't know about redlining. Some people do not know. People think reparations automatically simply slavery that, that ended in 1865. Even thinking about Juneteenth, which happened earlier this week, and thinking about people talking about Juneteenth, talking about, well, well, most people think, you know, most people think that slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Why would anyone think that slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation was a military declaration uh, uh, over states that the Union did not have control over and only applied to deep South secessionist states, right? It did not apply to slaveholding border states. It did not apply to when Union soldiers took over formerly held secessionist states. They were still slaves in some of those, those instances. The Union, People don't even know that the unions, union did actually still use slave labor in slave states when they were doing different things. So there's a lot of stuff that 
people don't know about history. But when we move forward, people don't know. I've seen people talking about how, you know, when there was some, um, you know, freeing, emancipating of slaves, the United States government reimbursed gave reparations to slave owners, right? And then there are some very real instances when we come forward, we come through the years of Jim Crow, and when we talk about being up north, we did not have Jim Crow to technically, right? But we still had differentials in, in wages. I mean, people are really excited about FDR. When we look at the social the creation of the Social Security Administration, the creation of Social Security that disproportionately left out, you know, tons of, of, of black workers across the board. So there, there are a lot of different metrics that we can look at, even coming now forward with the war on drugs, right? And, 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 and disproportionate funding in terms of schools, which is directly tied to the massive redlining, which a recent study just came out and talked about the billions of wealth that has been stolen from black communities because of the way homes in black communities were devalued. I remember when I first learned about redlining and learned about the de-incentivizing, like the United States government, people don't understand, the United States government de-incentivized integrated neighborhoods. You wouldn't, if you were a white couple and you wanted the new funding that was coming around for housing when the Federal mm -hmm. Housing Authority was created in the 30s, you would not get said funding if you were living in an integrated neighborhood. Because some people did, particularly when they were up, particularly up north, right? But if you move to these new, when they started creating the suburbs, like 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 uh, uh, when the creation of the highway, they were segregated housing, white owned. When people came back from the GI Bill from, from their service in World War II, um, you know, there's accounts of soldiers Black soldiers in World War II that had racist incidences. I mean, we need to be reevaluating dishonorable discharges like the one my grandfather received, which by, he's passed away now, but anecdotally had to do with a racist incident with white officers. So there's so much that's so rich, that's so documented, we need a study. We need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, honestly, and we need to learn the lessons of what happened in South Africa and how, what worked and what didn't work in the aftermath. That's really what we need to be looking at when we're adopting here in the United States of America and talking about moving forward and how to systemically invest. And know that, what is it, the 1030 program or whatever it is that Clyburn and, and Bernie Sanders have signed on to, mm -hmm. that's not reparations. You know, programs that disproportionately may, in theory, benefit Black people or Latinos or other, you know, people of color, that's not the same thing as actually addressing the systemic issues and racism that has minimized opportunity and has widened the chasm in terms of wealth and accumulation. And it doesn't matter how much you talk about we're going to make it equal for everyone, making it equal for everyone doesn't address the past harm. Mm. And I have to, I have to go back to your point about uh, the hashtag, I think you said the hashtag activists who many of whom, most of whom are black and they get the history wrong. So they leave out uh, the, the connection to uh, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora and the importance of their struggle with the struggle of uh, the quote unquote American descendants of slaves. So that's the ADOS hashtag. Uh, Anoa, and then I wanna bring this to you, Mark. Uh, it was important that uh, Sir uh, uh, Beckles, Sir Hillary Beckles, who was the chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, was in attendance at the hearings yesterday, and he spoke on a panel yeah. uh, at uh, yeah. Metropolitan AME uh, uh, Church in Washington, D.C., after the hearings, and he brought that historical connection between Africans in the diaspora and their struggle for reparations and justice. And as you said, Anoa, uh, the desire for a truth and reconciliation commission on an international scale, but he also made it clear that there is a link between that struggle and the struggle of African Americans, that this hashtag uh, uh, movement seems to not believe exists or they dismiss it. So Anoa and then Mark, um, how, how do we respond in this um, resurgence or this refocusing on reparations and a reshaping of this conversation about reparations? How do we respond to the more problematic aspects of the ADOS movement? And how, but how do we also fold them into this discussion so that we all move forward together? Yeah, I think that's a really good good framing and, and, and question, right? Like, 
Like, um, I think that it's it's really important to have, like we were just talking about, having a real clear conversation around the education, the policy, the real analysis that needs to happen to understand this, right? Because it's not just that Americans, and Black Americans included, are not well informed about the history. I mean, when people make comments about, well, you know, uh, 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 such and such island that's not the same when those people come here. I mean, my, grand my great grandparents came here in the late 1800s, early 1900s from Barbados and Cape Verde. Um, and so they very much had to deal with, you know, the children that they, they ended up raising across the 30s. My grandmother, as a first generation immigrant in Brooklyn, was still a black woman raising black children in the projects subsequently in Brooklyn, right? My mother's family is, you know, they, they are from the South. They're from South Carolina. They're from Denmark, South Carolina. That's right now dealing with that, that major water crisis. And so, yes, so, so on that side, um, someone probably with the last name Johnson or Butler owned our family down here on this end. But the struggles and experiences, I mean, you even have my, my stepmother's family who, even though they lived in the islands, they end up settling in the South. So there's a lot of misunderstanding of how people migrated, how things happen. And it really, actually, when we're talking about the system and institution of slavery, it's not simply how things manifested right here on this soil when it was an international system, an international capitalistic endeavor that crossed across so many different nations. So the fact that we're all even sitting here, those of us who are descendants of, of slaves in America, descendants of enslaved Africans in America, we were brought here not by people here in America necessarily. We were brought here by the Portuguese, by the British, by the Spanish, by countless, you know, I mean, what, what has happened across the diaspora and it ties into our domestic policy and, and our interventionalism. We think about manifest destiny and the way in which we ran up in Puerto Rico and Guam and so many other countries and the way that the United States is running up in so many different countries, whether intentionally, like with actual people in spaces or just simply funding incursions in other countries or now, it is all interrelated. And the sooner and better, we have a better understanding of how to address what's at the root cause, white supremacy, you know, and, and, and unfettered American capitalism, the better off we'll be overall. But we need to have real focused conversations and educating people across this whole conversation about what it is, what it isn't, and how it should apply. Because then you have on the counter the other side, you have black Republicans who are coming out, well, I don't need reparations. Well, good for you. You don't need, you, you shut up. My, these communities, you will have similar situated, you have similar situated communities that have similar incomes, and, uh, white and black, but you'll have a complete different in terms of house values and, and funding for the public schools. And that is a very real issue and it needs to be addressed. Mark, what are your thoughts on, on this uh, argument that there is a, uh, that there is and there should be a disconnection between the struggle for reparative justice in Africans in the, in the diaspora and African Americans or the descendants of American slaves, so to speak? Um, I have a... I have a it, it's, it's something I would, I rest, I've thought about it and I wrestle with, and I, and, and I think that there's... Where do I start this? We don't have that much time. So... <laughs> we never do. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, th I think on the, on the one level, it's important for activists to raise the issue, the connectivity of this issue. I think it's really critical. Um, some, I think, but sometimes we have to get America to understand why we have to have this discussion. Why the discussion of reparations is important. Why it's a critical issue. Why it's an American. For, we have to make it first, I think, an American issue. Okay. And, and get people to see what it's about. And I think that, and I think that we, it, well, I, I think it's politically important to, to make those connections. Because I think those are the things that are important to do to keep pushing this conversation and pushing our understanding of the, of our history and society and pushing us in the contradictions that led us here. That that we we can never we can never stop doing that, and we have to do that. That the broader conversation, if we want to get people engaged, has to be what what why people have talked about reparations for such a long time and why we're afraid to talk about it and what it means for all of us. It's like what I said to you earlier, we, we had this conversation about. This piece I'm working on now about uh, what it means to be an American, and what it, these concepts of freedom and liberty and justice, and how no, they weren't just the written words of white men of property. Yes, they were, but 
they came out of the struggles of indigenous people because they saw the freedom in indigenous people and they saw, and the, and, the, and the struggle for freedom was embodied in the struggle of black people in this country and across the diaspora to make it happen. So it inspired the world, but we think it as these white men who wrote this thing, and that's what it means. We have to make people, I think, make people understand this is an American struggle. This is about who we are as a people. This came out of our past and our present, and we have to address it. And, and, and I think that's, I think that's the only way we get the discussion in front of people for them to hear it. And, and I think part of the discussion is a connectivity but I do believe, I, I guess, where I might disagree is that I think if that if, if a connectivity is the dominant part of the discussion, then it never becomes a popular discussion. I think it. I think you have to make people get it first, and bring them in. You know, it's like um, an example, very quickly. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, one of the, one of the things, the, the, one of the ways that white people overcome racism is not through lectures, um, but is through struggle. Mm. And I remember in my early days as a tenant organizer, where we organized the first interracial tenants union in the city we are in now, in Baltimore, back in the early 70s. It was called the Tenants Union Group. And the, the black, white working class live on one side of Charles Street, and the black working class live in the neighborhood called Sharp Leaden Hall on the other side of Charles Street, which is one of the oldest free black neighborhoods in the country. And um, uniting those white and black people who had never talked to each other, let alone cross the street in a struggle against their landlords, then began to make the white tenants understand to what their black brothers and sisters were going through, and that began to change the nature of their racial thinking. Mm. And we actually turned two precincts away from George Wallace into George McGovern. We couldn't get him to Shirley Chisholm. I may have voted for Shirley Chisholm. We couldn't get him there, but we did get him away from George Wallace. So, and so, so what you're I'm, saying it's a two-step... Yeah, it's a it, two, maybe a multi-step process to get people uh, understanding uh, uh, a smaller, more narrow concept so that they can grasp a larger yeah. concept so that uh, the, the, the wider issue becomes more Yes, and for me, clear. Maybe, maybe my problem is maybe I'm... Maybe with the way I say, I say this because I, I, I'm seeing it through the lens of, of a community organizer, of people, of somebody, you know, of, of, of how you organize a political movement to make change happen. And, and so it's a complex thing, you know, and I think that one of the things that people like us do is to make that connectivity, to make those connections about capitalism, oppression, and the rest that has to happen. But you also got to bring people into the fold so they can begin to wrestle with it. Mm. You know, so they're not immediately going, I'm not giving black folks money. Mm. Mm. You know? Right, right. I mean, so, so let me, let me from, from one community organizer to another, I know I'm going <laughs> to give you, I'm going to give you the last word on this. What are your thoughts on this conversation of connectivity or disconnectivity between uh, American descendants of slaves and this conversation on reparations to uh, African descendants of slaves throughout the diaspora being uh, a, a two or a multi-step process. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, we don't, can't hear you. I'm muted myself. Apologies. I think that Mark brings up some really good, you know, points for consideration about how we talk to people, particularly white people, explaining like how this works and other people who are non-black. I think we have multiple conversations that need to take place, right? And not every conversation, it's like, the, like when we talk about we meet people where they are, right? So there are levels to conversations within community spaces, within other spaces, within policy and organizing. But I do agree that we do need to really, you know, talk and, and really grapple with, 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 with folks on, on what the issue is, what we're really talking about, and why a, a study is even necessary, right? In the history, the historical perspective understanding, and it could lead to helping people have other insight into how they should be organizing because quite honestly, you know, people in West Virginia, for example, you know, I spent several years living in West Virginia in Appalachia, um, Appalachian organizers and those who have had family in the coal mines or have had communities decimated by industry should be looking at some type of uh, restitutional process for what has happened in those communities, right? That's right. We have Right. Many communities that have been decimated, that's a different conversation, right? But I think that when we talk about modeling or we're talking about the economic uh, wave of organizing that needs to happen to actually lift people up, there is a restorative process that communities can start to understand and learn about through their own lens to understand why the massive 
exploitation of black people that has happened over the course of several hundred years at this point, because it hasn't stopped, right? We continue to still have disproportionate, uh, uh, serious disparities across many that, that directly go back to policy initiatives and legislative efforts that were taken up by the United States government. And so that is something that needs to be considered. And, you know, like, like everyone else says, I mean, y'all pay for all them expensive ass wars. Uh, uh, we can start uh, uh, doing right by people right here in the United States of America who pay taxes. So. As with just about everything we talk about here on The Real News, we never have enough time to dig deep into these topics. And certainly this is a topic that we will not uh, stop talking about, nor should we. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to leave this conversation here today. So I want to thank you, Mark, for joining me in the My studio. Pleasure. And thank you, Anora, for joining me uh, via Skype from Atlanta, yeah. Georgia, by the way. This is Jacqueline Lukeman, and this is The Real News Network.